Um, I arrived in Parliament in 2010 after 30 years of political activism, and it has to be said that in Parliament we are in a position of privilege. And it's always been my view that those with privilege, your moral duty is to defend those who have little or no power, and that is not what I've seen in Parliament. What I've witnessed since I arrived there in May 2010 is a <coughs> focused, systematic, political attack by the government on the weak and the voiceless and the defenceless. And let's be clear, they're driving this agenda not because they have to, because they want to. And it's not the popular view, if you talk to people in the street, it's all about the deficit, let's get the deficit down. But it's not that, oh, they'll get the deficit down and then it'll all be okay. The deficit is just the smokescreen to allow them to sway public opinion to get the sort of society that they want. Um, and they've, they've done this, and they've done this very successfully. And it has to be said that the Labour Party is very tied up in internal pathos over a leadership election and all sorts of different things that we didn't seize the agenda. And the rhetoric was, was um, driven by the coalition government and picked up by the media because it's an easy story, isn't it? Blame somebody else. And it's quite popular to do, to say, for people who are frightened, and people are frightened, to think it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. It's the immigrant across the road, or it's the uh, single mum next door, or it's the people who aren't working, or it's somebody's fault, or it's public servants' fault, it's their fault, because they're all on tea breaks and have got all pensions. So it's an easy way to drive your agenda, is to set person against person while you're all looking at each other. It's like the way a pickpocket works, you know, you say, look at that person over there, and when you're looking over there, they nick the wallet out of your back pocket. And it's the same thing, that's the way the government works. And the way that they did take um, that window of opportunity and drive public opinion was by telling eight economic lies, really. Um, the first lie was that government debt was the highest it's ever been, and that's simply not true. UK uh, debt was about 70% of GDP, which is high, but it's not unprecedented at all. I mean, up to about um, the 1960s, it was, it was much higher than that. It was 80 to 90%. And in uh, the end of the Second World War, it was 250%. And that was at a time when we then had the 1945 government and created the welfare state that's now being completely dismantled. The second lie is that the UK's debt crisis is the worst in the world, and that's not true. The IMS figures show that the UK has the lowest government debt amongst those G7 countries, so that's lower than the US and Canada, Japan, Italy, France and Germany. And that's certainly proved, uh, proved to be true if you look at the Eurozone. The third lie was that government debt is unsustainable, and that's not true. The sustainability of government debt depends on how it's made up, not just the size of it. And um, in countries such as Greece, all, nearly all their debt is external debt. Um, whereas in the UK, 70% of the UK debt is internal debt. So it's the difference between owing money to your mum and owing it to a Wonga. You know, it's, it's, it's a completely different type of debt. The fourth line was that government uh, public spending got out of control under Labour, and that's not true. We did raise public spending, but if you remember what it was like in the 70s, you know, with buckets in classrooms where the roof was dripping and people, you know, sleeping under underpasses. I mean, that, that's the vision that's, that's coming back now, but th there was necessary public spending. It was not out of control. Uh, the fifth line was that the UK has a big public sector compared to other countries, and that's simply not true either. Um, public spending in the UK is lower than France, Italy, Austria, Belgium, and the Scandinavian countries. And um, on education, for instance, the UK spends less per pupil than most comparable countries. Uh, we're certainly not profligate in public spending. And at the moment, I think the PCS um, says that there's a, about 4,000 jobs a month in public services that are being um, got rid of. So uh, that's just absolutely not true. Public sector workers are overpaid. And if there's any public sector workers here, they will know that that simply is not true. Um, that's not what the data shows. Public se sector workers may be sometimes fairly paid, but they're not overpaid. Well, what happens is private sector workers are, are exploited and are underpaid. And that's another one of those setting worker against worker. <coughs> and the new intake, the new 2010 Tory intake, is mainly made up of people who worked in the city on very, um, very large salaries. And their agenda is to drive our economy um, to be in line with the Hong Kong style economy where you've got very, very low tax, virtually no public services at all, and it's completely market-driven. And that, that's what this is about, dismantling things, dismantling the welfare state, dismantling the NHS, and dismantling the education system in a way of making you know, free schools and academies. Um, 
The seventh line is that cu cutting public spend um, spending will avoid um, economic disaster. And that's not true. Um, there, there are different ways that you grow the economy. Um, one is exports, which is going to be difficult when the rest of the Eurozone, which is one of our big customers, is in complete recall. Um, investment, which is what they're not doing. Household spending. Now, you'll all know from your own households, people are reluctant to spend on anything that they don't have to at the moment because everybody is afraid for their job. And government spending, which is being completely, completely slashed. So it's fairly obvious that this sort of um, agenda that they're driving will deal, um, lead to a double dip, which is exactly what has happened. Um, and the last lie of all, which is the one that got most traction, was that the deficit was all Labour's fault. And that simply wasn't true. Lehman Brothers in the US did not collapse because Gordon Brown spent on the NHS. That did not happen. Um, Labour's actions at the time of the economic crisis actually saved the country from going to the wall. And at that time, the Tories were the only people in the UK and around the world that argued that um, the Labour government's support for the economy shouldn't be provided. Um, so they were saying at the time that we shouldn't have done anything and the whole thing would have collapsed and then what would have happened? I mean, Alistair Darling got a call on a Friday night from the banks saying we're in an absolute crisis. And he said, how long have we got? And they said, till Monday. By Monday, your chip and pin won't work. You won't be able to get money out of the hole in the wall. You'll go to the supermarket and they won't be able to process. You know, so that's like 48 hours from disaster. What, what was the government meant to do? What would any government do? It would try and safeguard its people and that's what, that's what the Labour government did. But there's always a choice, a political choice, and that was a political choice that was made. And it's not one that the Conservatives would have made or are going to make now. Um, what we could be doing is we could be closing tax loopholes, which is... Um, Avoidance has just been mentioned. I mean, if you look recently at the uh, Sunday Times rich list, how the rich have all got suddenly en enormously richer, and yet the tax take hasn't gone up. So there's something weird going on there. I mean, that's just basic maths that the tax take sh should go up if their income has gone up, but clearly that's not the case. Um, we could be looking at uh, getting rid of Trident. We could be looking at massive consultancy fees or PFI deals. We could be looking at um, also. The issue of tax avoidance, one of, one of the areas um, where it's been absolutely shameful is the fact that government departments are taking people on what they call personal service contracts. Mm -hmm. So instead of actually employing them, so they pay national insurance and they pay full tax, they're actually taking them on a consultancy. Well, that's government departments. I mean, they're defrauding themselves of their own revenue. It's absolutely ridiculous. But as I say, these are all political choices. But we don't have to live in this sort of world. But... These are Osborne's eight lies. He knows their lies, he trades on those lies, he's convinced the public of their lies, those lies, but they won't work. He's the wrong man with the wrong answers, the wrong solutions, they won't work, and he needs to go. And one of the best things that's happened recently is that Osborne was always seen as the uh, major strategist, and all of a sudden, his own Tory benches are looking at him and thinking, how could you have got us in this mess? How could anyone have dreamt up capacity tax, that's ridiculous. You know, so the fact that he's lost his, his credibility amongst his own side is a really important thing. I was going to talk a bit about housing, I was going to talk a bit about welfare, but mainly it's all been said. But what I would say, which I think is really important about welfare, is that um, the demonisation of people on welfare is absolutely disgraceful. And uh, if any of you read The Independent, I think it was on Thursday, Owen Jones, who was here recently, uh, wrote a piece about Carol Malone, who I believe writes for The Sun. Um, no, it was uh, Sunday People. Oh, it was Sunday People. And on Thursday, I think it was Thursday, she was on daytime TV talking about the terrible tragedy of the five, I think it's six now, children who died in a house fire. <coughs> she said, well, it's understandable that someone might have done this because people are angry because this family were blatantly on benefits, they'd asked for a bigger house, and people were upset. And she actually said that this was an accident waiting to happen. And what, what was shameful about that is she wasn't actually challenged on that because I think the presenters were so amazed at what she'd said. But that, that's, that's where people are getting to, that somehow or other, you know, disabled people should be forced for um, an interview to prove their disability. And this is what's happening all the time. But one of the reasons why is the Department of Work and Pensions now describes welfare as an annual multi-billion pound market. 
That's how they see it. They see it as a market. There's all this money going into welfare, and somebody needs to make a profit out of it. That's all they understand. So the department's own research shows that job centre um, staff outperform the private sector when they're trying to help people back into work. But they're cutting back on job centres, and now all the contracts for the welfare programmes have gone to private companies. So this is this is their agenda: <laughs> is to actually take the welfare <coughs> sector apart. And it's, it's, it's upsetting sometimes when you speak to people and they say, but if Labour get back in, you know, will you reverse the cuts? But it's not a case of reversing the cuts, it's will you rebuild because those things won't actually be there. And public services, for instance, public services were run won by trade unions, struggles in an effort to establish the basis of a civilised society. But when the public see public servants and public services as something to resent rather than to cherish, you can see that the Tories have actually won the battle of ideas here with the general public. So I think it's our job is to make sure that we point out the twisted truth that people are being told and get public opinion on our side. And our job is to cut through those lies and build our own coalition.